Off the top of your head, what is the coolest, creepiest, weirdest feature film debut you can think of? The Evil Dead? Eraserhead? Maybe The Wicker Man? How about Donnie Darko, Richard Kelly's wildly ambitious and mystifying mashup of science fiction, psychological horror, teen comedy, and coming-of-age art house film all rolled into one trippy and head-spinning tale of doomsday surrealism. Indeed, as unique a debut as any we've seen in the past 20 years, the making of Donnie Darko and its road to success are just about as strange and oddly captivating as the movie itself. Released shortly after the world-altering events of September 11, 2001, Donnie Darko did not perform well at the box office. Hell, the movie almost premiered on the Stars Network. Luckily, the home video release came just as DVDs began to soar in popularity allowing the film to gain a massive cult following around the world, the UK in particular, and has since been hailed as one of the most memorable movies to be released in the past two decades. But before delving into the eventful fate of Donnie Darko and its ascension into becoming a post-facto cult classic, it's worth breaking down how the 26-year-old writer and director Richard Kelly, fresh out of USC film school, was able to conceptualize, prepare, and execute what is now considered one of the most mesmerizing and mind-blowing of movie debuts ever committed to celluloid. A lot to chew on, so let's gnaw our way through the fat and get to the bone of what the f*** happened to Donnie Darko. As always, we start with a quick plot refresher. Donnie Darko follows the troubled titular teenager who awakens on the top of a mountain after one of his sleepwalking escapades. While he was away, a jet engine fell from the sky and landed in his bedroom. It happens. Meanwhile, a terrifying six-foot bunny rabbit named Frank suddenly appears and warns Donnie that the world will end in 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, and 12 seconds, essentially a full lunar month. With the tacit understanding that he may have to prevent such a calamity, Donnie rides his bike home and begins a ticking clock quest to find answers to who Frank is and how he's related to the jet engine that crashed into his room. Thematically and subtextually, the film includes far more in it than that, but for our purposes, the basic synopsis should suffice. Now, on to the development. Upon graduating from USC's School of Cinematic Arts in 1997, the 23-year-old Kelly began working as a production assistant at a post-production facility, where he eventually became inspired to write his first feature-length screenplay. He began writing the early drafts of Donnie Darko in October 98, which is why he set the film around October. According to an interview he gave with the BBC, Kelly wanted to write an ambitious, personal and nostalgic tale about the 1980s, which pushed the envelope by combining science fiction with a coming-of-age tale. Oddly enough, Kelly wrote the script for Donnie Darko in 28 days. He also shot the film in 28 days, mirroring the period of time in which the film takes place. The symmetry is striking, if not totally unsettling. According to The Guardian, Kelly intended the script to be an amusing and poignant recollection of suburban America in the Reagan era, and that he drew inspiration from the falling jet engine landing in Donnie's room from an urban legend he heard as a child, in which a large piece of ice fell from the wing of an airplane and crashed into a boy's bedroom while he was away, thereby narrowly escaping his demise. Kelly almost used ice instead of the jet engine in the film because of this, but decided to base the entire story around the mystery of where the jet engine came from in the first place. From the outset, Kelly was insistent upon setting the film in 1988, an era he felt was underrepresented in movies and would make for a scintillating setting. After being pressured by some to contemporize the story, Kelly stuck to his guns and retained the time frame, setting the film at Halloween during an impending presidential election. According to an interview with Rebecca Murray, Kelly originally had Donnie waking up in a shopping mall before changing the location to a golf course as he meets Jim Cunningham for the first time. Patrick Swayze, who plays Cunningham, reportedly sported his own clothing from the 1980s for the role. Barring the schizophrenic pathology of Donnie himself, Kelly drew many elements of the story from his own life. In addition to living in nearby Midlothian, Virginia, which is where early drafts of the story were set before being changed to Middlesex, Virginia, Kelly really knew an eerie elderly woman in his hometown, who was known by locals as Grandma Death and would constantly stand by the side of the road and check her mailbox all day long. 
Kelly also had his own bouts with sleepwalking as a teenager and weaved the eerie storyline into the narrative. According to BFI, Kelly can't discern whether he drew inspiration for Frank being a rabbit from a dream or his love of Richard Adams' Watership Down, which figures prominently in the director's cut. As for Donnie's fractious mental state, Kelly researched schizophrenia online before writing and, per the LA Times, thought such a nebulous medical condition would make for a great way to ground in a supernatural story in science. According to producer Sean McKittrick, Kelly's original script for Donnie Darko was 145 pages long, which he helped to whittle down to a more palatable length while clarifying some of the more confusing plot points. Upon shopping the script in 1999, Kelly was met with resistance by nearly every studio and indie producer in town, especially when he insisted on directing it himself as a first-time filmmaker. Moreover, the challenging nature of the script led McKittrick to tell the LA Times that the challenging script in town that everybody wanted to make but was too afraid. After thinking the project was all but dead by 1999, Kelly secured representation from CAA and began meeting with several prominent Hollywood names, none more important than Francis Ford Coppola. It was Coppola who distilled the thematic heft of the story down to a single line of dialogue in the screenplay telling Kelly that high school teacher Karen Pomeroy's quote, the kids have to figure it all out these days because the parents, they don't have a clue. It's what the whole movie is all about. After Coppola's blessing, Kelly began his casting process with confidence. According to reports, Vince Vaughn was offered the role of Donnie but declined thinking he was too old to play a high school kid. He was roughly 30 at the time. Mark Wahlberg, who's one year younger than Vaughn, was very interested in playing Donnie, but only agreed to do so if he could play the part with a verbal lisp. Now that would have been an interesting movie. By 2000, Jason Schwartzman agreed to star as Donnie, which Kelly claims gave him legitimacy as a filmmaker and drew the single most important cast member to the production, Drew Barrymore. Without Barrymore spearheading production and playing Karen Pomeroy, Kelly admits the film would have premiered on the Stars Network instead of premiering theatrically. That's right, the little girl from E.T. lights up Donnie Darko with her own magical touch time and again. After agreeing to play Karen in the film, Barrymore set up the film at her own production company, Flower Films, and allotted a moderate $4.5 million budget to produce Donnie Darko. All of this occurred while Barrymore was filming Charlie's Angels. Part of Barrymore's contract included a short one-week window to film all of her scenes, which rapidly sped up production to a summer 2000 shooting schedule. This forced Schwartzman to bow out of the lead role, prompting Kelly to meet with such candidates as Patrick Fugit and Lucas Black to play Donnie. However, it was Jake Gyllenhaal who was so enthused by the script that he reportedly swerved his car to the side of the road to finish reading it. For the role of Donnie's father, Eddie, Tim Robbins was initially approached before Holmes Osborne was eventually cast. Mara Wilson was also in the running for Donnie's young sister, Samantha, although she was so freaked out by the script that she declined. When Mary McDonald was cast as Mother Rose Darko, she was so excited by the part that she received a speeding ticket after racing to the set too fast. Speaking of racing, with an accelerated production schedule set to start one month later, it was Gyllenhaal who suggested his sister Maggie Gyllenhaal be cast as Elizabeth Darko, which still marks the only time the two siblings have shared the screen together. Jake Gyllenhaal was given free reign to add his own ideas and interpretations of the character, which included Donnie's childlike vocal tone when speaking to Frank, which Gyllenhaal likened to, quote, a child talking to his blanket. As for Patrick Swayze and Noah Wiley being cast as Jim Cunningham and Kenneth Monatoff, Kelly credits producer Nancy Juvenin for landing such seasoned actors. The 28-day film shoot on Donnie Darko took place between July and August of 2000, with Long Beach, California serving as the primary location standing in for Middlesex, Virginia. The opening mountain shots were filmed along Angeles Crest Highway, and the school interiors and exteriors were shot at Loyola High School in Los Angeles. One of the smartest things Kelly did during pre-production was to hire Steven Poster to be his cinematographer, who worked as an assistant director on Blade Runner two decades prior. According to Poster via IndieWire about his initial meeting with Kelly, we read every word, every sentence, every page, every scene in the movie. I made him justify to me why he wanted that in the movie. I wanted him to be able to tell me what each scene was going to tell the audience. Thanks to the steady hand of the cinematographer, Kelly did not have a huge number of technical or logistical problems, memorable onset injuries, or many production halting accidents during principal, which is quite a miracle for a 20-something first-time filmmaker. 
No, the toll of filming came from the immense stress of making a first time feature film in 28 days, a breakneck effort that resulted in Kelly losing 20 pounds during the shoot. Kelly and Poster opted to film using a Panasonic Panastar camera. Doing so in an anamorphic format, Kelly hoped would seduce the audience from the opening shot pushing in on Donnie atop the mountain at dawn. The anamorphic format entails filming in widescreen onto 35mm film stock. Stephen Poster suggested using Kodak 800 ASA film stock to combat any lighting issues, which despite public pushback that contended was too grainy and indecipherable, ended up working extremely well for the visual aesthetic Kelly was aiming for. One of the most difficult scenes to shoot included the jet engine falling from the sky into Donnie's bedroom. According to The Ringer, the shot was done in one take after a real jet engine was purchased for $10,000. To achieve the shot, the hull of the jet engine was suspended above the set and a pressurized air gun was used to plummet the engine through the roof. While many implored Kelly that jet engines do not fall off of airplanes, while the movie was being filmed in August 2000, a dishwasher-sized mechanical airplane part fell off a Boeing 747 and landed on a beach. Serendipity? Mere coincidence? What the f indeed? Another standout sequence in the film includes the dazzling school montage set to Tears for Fears Head Over Heels. Producer and line managers were irate over the scene resembling little more than a glorified, self-indulgent music video completely devoid of plot advancing dialogue. However, once Kelly showed the sequence in totality when it was finished, the producer shut up and realized how rad the montage is and how much it conveys in terms of mood and atmosphere. A bit of a risk, Kelly actually choreographed the scene to head over heels before production even secured the licensing rights to the song. According to Poster, Samantha Darko's sparkle motion dance sequence was one of the most difficult to get right, eventually opting to use smoke as a substitute for light to make shadows and silhouettes appear during the stage performance. In terms of how Kelly conceived the cartoonish translucent tubes emanating from the solar plexus of Donnie that allow him to see future events, according to the DVD commentary, Kelly was inspired by watching the late football legend John Madden diagnose a play using a telestrator, in which he would pause a video and draw on the screen to show where the players would go next. Watching this while high, Kelly was so influenced by Madden that he incorporated the scene in which Donnie watches football with his dad and is summoned from upstairs by the prophetic spherical tube. As for trivial changes made during production, Kelly originally had the movie Chud playing at the movie theater Donnie and Gretchen visit but couldn't track down who owned the rights. In a fortuitous turn, Sam Raimi stepped up and allowed Kelly to use and alter footage from his feature debut, The Evil Dead, for free. Thematically, The Evil Dead makes far more sense to play in the film than should, and definitely adds to the hypnotic sway of the movie. When Donnie first arrives home after sleepwalking at the start of the filming, his mother Rose is seen reading Stephen King's It in the backyard. Kelly originally wanted her to read King's Tommyknockers instead, but producers found it harder to obtain the rights to use it. However, when Donnie expresses fantasizing about Christina Applegate to his therapist, he originally pined for Alyssa Milano in the script, but had to be changed for legal purposes. Also, the scene in which naturally Donnie corrects Gretchen on how to pronounce their teacher's name came about because Jenna Malone could not say Professor Kenneth Monotoff without stumbling. Upon wrapping principal photography in August 2000, Donnie Darko made its world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival five months later on January 19th, 2001. At that time, the film ran two hours and 45 minutes long. According to many, this cut strongly resembles the director's cut that Kelly would re-edit in just nine days at the behest of New Market Films a couple years later. Despite his excellent performance in a film that was shot entirely out of sequence, Jake Gyllenhaal and co-star Seth Rogen both agreed at the rap party that neither of them had a clue what the movie was about. Interpretations indeed vary to this day about the meaning of Donnie Darko, but that's another video altogether. Now. Here's where things get a little loopy. Just when Kelly thought his movie was doomed for an inevitable cable release on the Stars Network, spending six months struggling to find a distributor, he almost gave up on the notion that his feature debut would play in movie theaters. A major sticking point at that time, not too far removed from the devastating Columbine High School Massacre in 1999, was that Donnie shoots a gun in the film, making distributors very worried about the commerciality of the project. Kelly was asked to cut 30 minutes from the film to get the runtime to a manageable figure. Despite the perceived flaws, New Market purchased the film and agreed to release the film theatrically along with IFC Films. 
Kelly credits Drew Barrymore for securing the new market deal after literally begging her to sort out the matter when the company had initial plans for a straight-to-video release. However, many people do not realize that it was a young Christopher Nolan hot off Memento, still a fresh Hollywood face in his own right, who Kelly really credits for securing a theatrical release deal for Donnie Darko. According to The Ringer, Nolan and his wife Emma Thomas had their Memento producer Aaron Ryder organize a private screening of the film for new market executives, which directly led to a theatrical deal. Once the distribution deal was locked, Kelly and Cruz spent the summer of 2001 trimming the film to tip-top shape, including one day of reshoots, which mainly entailed scenes of Frank during the infamously dour Mad World closing sequence. Believe it or not, in order to clarify the timeline of events in the film, it was Christopher Nolan's suggestion to add the intermittent title cards counting down to the end of the world on October 30th, 1988. Who knew? Of course, as happy as Kelly and company were to finally secure a theatrical release date on October 26, 2001, the entire world came crashing down, literally, on the fatefully tragic date of September 11, 2001. A whole new journey for Donnie Darko commenced after that. Released just six weeks after the 9-11 attacks, Donnie Darko failed to make a splash at the box office, earning a dismal $110,494 on opening weekend. According to New Market Films' Bob Burney, the bleak mood and the timing killed the movie's chances, left many critics at the time bewildered, and that the mood filtered through everything. A major problem concerned the depiction of a crashing airplane in the theatrical trailers for the movie, which were hastily removed following 9-11. According to Kelly, the movie was not, quote, attractive to people in that emotional, very deeply traumatizing chapter in our history. All told, Donnie Darko earned a paltry total of $1.48 million at the domestic box office. However, the film found a new life entirely on home video not long after where it steadily grew through word of mouth and slowly became a cult classic. Once the film caught on and was reissued in theaters, Donnie Darko actually recouped expenses by amassing $7.5 million at the global box office. Most people think of it as a financial flop, but the movie eventually earned back its initial budget with a little extra to spare. Thankfully, the film fared far more favorably in the UK theaters, before becoming even more popular on DVD home video releases. More than 300,000 tickets for the film were sold in the first six weeks of its theatrical UK release, where it grossed an equivalent of $2.5 million at the box office. Upon various VHS and DVD home video issues, Bernie declared the film a runaway hit, and it earned an additional $10 million in revenue. More recently, to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the movie, Arrow Films released a new two-disc Ultra HD Blu-ray box set that includes both the theatrical and director's cut in 4K. Once the film grew in popularity on home video in 2002, New Market's Bernie approached Kelly in 2003 about reshaping a director's cut edition of the film. Kelly agreed and restored roughly 20 minutes of originally shot footage back into the narrative, moved a few songs around, and explained more of Frank's mysterious nature. Without breaking down the differences between the original and the director's cut, the point is that the newfangled version Kelly edited helped turn the film into the beloved cult classic that it is today. In fact, the 2005 DVD release of the director's cut explores how the film grew in popularity over time by featuring a cult following video of rabid UK fans beaming how much Donnie Darko was meant to them. While an abominable sequel to Donnie Darko entitled S Darko came out in 2009, the less spoken about the better. Kelly had no involvement with that project whatsoever and has reportedly never seen it. Frankly, he gets quite annoyed when having to talk about it. No, far more fascinating is the prospect of a Donnie Darko sequel that Kelly has been kicking around since 2017. According to the playlist, Kelly met James Cameron in 2010, who admitted to being disturbed after watching Donnie Darko. After making Kelly explain to him what happened to Donnie's fate in the film, Kelly claims Cameron urged him to continue working on the project in some capacity, which rekindled Kelly's vigor for the project, noting that, quote, there was really something big, something epic that could be done. As of January 2021, Kelly told IGN that an enormous amount of work had been done on the script for the sequel. The question is, in this day and age, is whether or not it will be made as a theatrical feature film or perhaps a streamable TV series. In many ways, Kelly may want that stars deal after all. What would you rather see? A Donnie Darko movie or a Donnie Darko TV show? Let us know in the comments below.
And that is the gist of what the f happened to Donnie Darko. Written and filmed in as many days as the story takes place, the bright-eyed ambition and brilliant execution of Richard Kelly fresh out of film school continues to impress to this day. For all the production woes and frustrating setbacks during development, the film overcame a terribly timed theatrical release and has endured the test of time to become one of the strangest and most unsettling cinematic curios of the past 20 years. Now, bring on that encore.